How's it going? Great. I'm Em. Um, I live in Berlin. And I don't know if any of you have been to Berlin in the winter, but it is cold and dark and dismal. Um, and this year, I wanted to make sure that I actually got some exercise. So I went out and bought this thing called a smart trainer, uh, which is a contraption. You can see here that you hook your regular bike into it, and it turns it into a stationary bike. And it gives you a wireless connection so you can connect to it from your tablet or your computer. And you can both read how fast and how hard you're pedaling, and you can control the resistance, so make it easier or harder to pedal. Um, and so I spent a bunch of time playing this really cool game called Zwift. That's sort of the cycling MMO where you ride around a virtual world and deck out your avatar with cycling gear and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and it was really cool and easily the best thing I could find commercially available for the hardware. Uh, but I was also a little frustrated with it. It was less of a game and more like a very serious training tool for cyclists that had some game-like stuff sprinkled on top of it. Um, so I'm a game designer. Uh, but I specifically make games that use non-traditional interfaces, um, and specifically found objects, like a lot of hardware, uh, like you can see here games made on a 1920s telephone switchboard, or 1800s telegraph hardware, um, or sometimes sort of software objects rather than physical objects, but things like this is a game where you are, a, you are sexting with a robot by sending it photos using your phone's normal camera and SMS app, building on top of these existing interfaces and paradigms that you know. Uh, so I was really interested to see, well, what does it mean to make a game on top of the smart bike? Uh, so this talk is gonna be broadly about that prototyping process and talking through a few examples where sort of my own design thoughts intersected with really hard engineering problems that came out of, well, I'm taking something that wasn't meant to be made into a game and making it into a game, but the result was actually a better design. Um, but I'm gonna start by taking a step back and ask why. Like one answer is why not? This is really cool and fun. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. So, the way you physically interact with something really meaningfully affects your emotional response to it. Uh, you feel very emotionally different about an app you use on your phone versus using even the same service as a web app, or playing a game with a controller versus a mouse and keyboard, or even like typing on your like, Apple laptop's tiny keyboard keys versus a juicy mechanical keyboard. Um, and so if you're a designer or artist trying to make games or interactive art, that is a really powerful tool in your tool belt to play with. Like if you can change the way someone physically interacts with your game, you can meaningfully affect the way they're going to respond to your piece. And that's really cool. And I think it's really powerful to, to think about how can, we, how can we work with a specific medium and like work with the same way you talk about a like, how do you work with the grain of painting or carpentry or any sort of physical medium as an artist? What does it mean to do that for a given piece of technology? Um, but it also works the other way around. So I bought the stationary bike and realized I don't like stationary bikes. Um, everything that I love about biking, like having the wind rushing in your face or the satisfaction of getting from point A to point B, that doesn't exist on a stationary bike. Um, and Zwift has all of these sort of motivational hooks and retention tricks to try to get you to stay engaged, but that's all predicated on the fact that you training on this bike is already an activity that you enjoy. Whereas in my case, I could tell it was very quickly going to become this thing that just sat in the corner of my room. Um, so I wanted to make a game that was good enough that I'd intrinsically want to play it, and as a side effect, I would happen to get some exercise. Um, and I know this is a thing that is possible. This was me playing Dance Dance Revolution growing up. Um, a lot of the other games I showed you, that's essentially what those are. Like the switchboard game and the telegraph game are really fun games that secretly teach you about the history of technology. So I put all this together and I came up with a concept. Um, you are a bike messenger for a food delivery service like Uber Eats or Deliveroo or Seamless. So it's this game about the politics of on-demand labor where you're riding around like, the city you're physically in um, picking up and delivering orders and trying to make enough orders to make ends meet to actually make a minimum wage if you're lucky. Um, as you can see here, this actually looks like you might imagine the app might look like if you are a delivery writer and happen to be using an iPad instead of an iPhone for some reason. Um, and that's really intentional. Like the same way that the physical bike hardware acts as the sort of found medium to make an installation on top of, like knowing that there are actually people in 2019 who have this job and have software to use it, like that is a really powerful thing to build off of. So it was really important to me that I make this, you know, as a native Swift app using the Google Maps API rather than using Unreal or Unity or something more traditionally suited for games. Um, and so that led me to think of this as sort of two different separate versions of the game. This would let me design the version that I could sell to people who have this hardware who want to train. I could also then make an installation version where I'd show it at like, game exhibitions and indie game festivals and maybe have like a visualization that is running in a 3D engine while the person playing it is looking at an iPad on their screen. Um, 
And this all sounds well and good, but I ran into a problem really quickly, which is that it was pretty boring. Um, so I, I wired up the bike, like it, the process of actually talking to the Bluetooth hardware um, was, was relatively straightforward. Like the technical problems were more Googling Stack Overflow questions and poor documentation from my hardware manufacturer than like actually interesting media problems. Um, but once it was working, so if you think about this, your one input to this game is pedaling, um, which means like if a game is a series of meaningful choices or interesting choices, um, your one choice is do I pedal faster or not? Um, and in the grand scheme of things, like the choice of do you want to conserve your stamina or do you want to go all out, like that might be interesting, especially in concert with other complex interlocking systems, but by itself, that can't really sustain a game. Um, and this is a problem I had with Zwift. But so I started brainstorming, how can I add more interesting choices to this game? Uh, I wanted to give players a sense of autonomy of movement. Like maybe they know where they're trying to go, but they can choose how to get there. Maybe here we show them the obvious route that is the most direct, but maybe it's really hilly, there's a lot of traffic, and they can decide, do I go this route or do I try the other route that might be faster, but it's risky. Um, I think that could also add a lot to the aesthetic of the game if it feels like a free world that you can move around wherever you want. Um, so the vision I had was, you know, you're looking at this Google Maps view of the world, when you reach an intersection, you can decide, I want to turn left here. Um, and so I built this out, I, I came up with the idea that given there's an iPad mounted onto the bike, your iPad has accelerometers, uh, you can turn left or right in the handlebar, and we can use those motion sensors to detect when you have turned. Um, and that was pretty easy to wire up. Uh, but then I learned, Google Maps was really not meant to do that. Um, not specifically Google, this would have happened if I was using any other Maps provider. Um, but like, Commercial mapping APIs are really not intended to give you free movement on a map. So like, if you want to pedal forward to move forward on the street you're on, you have to think about what forward even means, which means you have to know which direction this road is going, which means you probably want vector data about that road. Um, and if there's one thing that a commercial mapping provider doesn't want to give you, it is the vector data that they consider their secret sauce. Um, I could likely build this myself on top of open street maps, but that is a lot of effort and sort of another part of the secret of why I like making games on top of existing technology is I get to co-opt other people's ridiculously large amounts of engineering effort. So that's no good for a prototype that might not even be fun. Um, so I realized I could sort of vaguely fudge things by saying, all right, I'm gonna pick a point far away and get turn-by-turn -turn directions there because we know that every mapping service is really good at giving you turn-by-turn -turn directions. Um, and so we can say, we're gonna get back a like a, a vector representing that route from the provider, and then we're gonna, as you pedal forward, we'll interpolate you along that route. Um, and that worked pretty well to figure out where you are moving, but then when you wanted to turn, that got really tricky. Um, so Google, for example, provides this API where you can give it a whole bunch of GPS coordinates and it'll try to snap them to a line so you can say, hey, this is where they probably lie on the street. Um, so when you turned, I would, make up a bunch of fictional GPS coordinates vaguely near where you were and sort of send out this point grid to Google and analyze the resulting data and try to figure out, does it look like there's a road here? If it is, where would I put the player? Um, and it sort of worked, but not with enough confidence to base an entire game on it, um, which made it really obvious that if the Google Maps API is this medium that I'm trying to build a game on top of, I was working against the grain of it. So I took a step back and realized, my goal was not to make it so that people could turn left at an intersection and move left. It was to create this sense of movement autonomy and add interesting choices around movement. Um, so if you think about what Google Maps gives you, uh, you can very easily get turn-by-turn -turn directions. You can very easily change those turn-by-turn -turn directions and say, I want to go somewhere else. Um, you can very easily put stuff on a map and tap on it. Um, so I built out a different system where any of the restaurants you can pick up at any given time are sitting there on the map. At any given time, there is a restaurant that you are moving towards. You can tap on any restaurant and suddenly change your routing so you're moving there dynamically. Uh, you don't have complete free movement across the entire world, but it sort of feels like you do. I mean, it felt good enough. And it also, oh, it also suggested this sort of powerful core game loop uh, where, so all of the orders would be delivered back to your home site. Like you can see here, there's a little home marker that actually is this office. Um, and so sort of one run of the game would be going out, picking up a bunch of orders, and bringing them back home. Uh, so there became this push their luck element where getting more orders means potentially more money, but if you take too long, then early orders are gonna be cold and you're gonna get a bad rating and maybe get fired. Uh, so there's this element of physical ability of how quickly can you move, but also planning as you figure out what is the right route to go in real time, where are the clusters of restaurants, which felt really good. Um, it was super easy to implement, which meant that I was probably like, working with the grain of what Google Maps wanted me to, 
Um, and it actually felt like a more coherent and elegant design than I started out with, uh, which I think is a great design example of stepping back and realizing that this underlying idea of autonomy and what I was trying to accomplish with the design was way more important than specifics and letting the affordances provided by this interface that I'm building a game on top of, like th letting that drive out the specifics was a really strong choice. Um, so this is really obvious and cliched, um, but I think this is a big part of what I like so much about making games like this on top of found technology. There's, there's novelty and people pay attention to it. Um, there are all the other cool things that are fun about dealing with hardware and software. Um, but to me, like, this is a great guiding light to drive design explorations. Um, and like, how is the design you're making emphasize the materiality of the underlying technology? Um, and maybe this is still a useful design lesson to remember even if you're not working with weird custom hardware or games or anything like that. Um, but I think it's one worth remembering. Um, unfortunately, I could not bring my hardware all the way here from Germany to give a live demo. Um, but come talk to me if you want to talk more about it, or especially if you happen to have a smart trainer and want to play test. So thanks. <laughs>